Hello everyone, um, welcome back to a couple of things. I mean, in a way, welcome back to the channel, kind of. I mean, um, only because we haven't been as active recently. Um, and there's no deep reason for that. It's very, very simple. It's, it's kind of just like, I mean, we said a while ago that it would be a chance we would take a break here or there. And a break really just being one week off. Um, and I think that's really justified, especially around this time. But what's more special about today is a welcome back to uh, Below Decks. Although, of course, this actual, this framing isn't particularly great. Obviously, it gets better when I actually click on the article itself. Um, so, yeah, we've got another Below Decks post. It's been, you know, it's been over a month since we've actually got anything from Ghost Ship aside from um, their live streams, which are informative. I'll give them that. The live streams are very informative and um, worth tuning into, I, I think. Um, but, yeah, this is... It, it's something. It's something to chew on, and, and I kind of appreciate that. Uh, it, I also appreciate the fact that Ghost Ship are really kind of in the midst of getting the ball rolling on Road Call. That's my understanding of sort of the progress is that they are in the stages of really refining what the game's going to be so they can really make it what it's going to be. That's kind of my understanding of, of sort of their progress, um, which is why I think we're probably going to hear some stuff uh, relatively soon. I, I I don't know if there'll be another um, on the horizon showcase or broadcast this year. I really hope there will be, and that will sort of be where we would um, start seeing stuff. Maybe some actual in-game footage, potentially screenshots of Rogue Core. I'm not sure. Um, what I do know is that's not happening yet. Um, but I don't think it's in the far future either. Um, if that would put anyone at ease, my sort of uh, inane ramblings about what may or may not be. But what we're really here to do is to go through this lovely below text post pr provided to us by Aaron, um, the content writer at Ghost Ship. Um, and it's lovely. Uh, it's about uh, cave generation in DRG, um, which is a really interesting subject to me. I think it's one of the most fascinating and um, impactful elements of the game that doesn't really get praised enough. So this will detail sort of the whole process, who's involved, all that kind of stuff. I'm basically going to give a full transcript by just reading it out, but also providing my insights along the way and sort of analysing some of the images in relation to what's said as well. Um, they basically, if you've, if you've watched one of these videos before, then you know exactly what this is. So, let's begin the article, Below Decks at Ghost Ship, Cave Generation in Deep Rock Galactic. Let's take a look under the hood of DRG's infinite cave machine. Um, hello miners, we've got another behind the scenes peek for you, this time on one of your most requested topics, cave generation. Let's explore how the caves of Hoxies get formed thousands of times over again every single day. Hope you like it. And I appreciate that as well. I think it's really cool that this is actually the very based on community requests, which is why I want to say something um, kind of, <laughs> I'm not saying that he's watching, but kind of to Aaron, um, in that I was kind of prepared perhaps on tomorrow's podcast to actually talk about how I kind of wonder what Aaron is, is doing exactly, because I feel like the frequency of these posts is perhaps not as great as I might expect. I'm not even sure if I agree with that. It's really what I'm trying to say. So actually, I think the rate of um, production on these these posts is actually fairly good. I do wonder if we'll get, start seeing other potential types of articles, potentially. I remember interviews with other devs actually being mentioned. I would love to see that. Um, but overall, after I've read this article and sort of understanding what it is, I can see why these take a long, like a long time. Um, and I think Aaron is doing very good work. He's a very good writer of these kind of um, behind the scenes articles. And I've enjoyed them quite a bit. Um, anyway. Let's get into it. Planting a cave seed. The moment you select a mission in Deep Rock Galactic, a cave is born. Out in some invisible abstract, the game generates a seed. This is a procedurally generated string of code containing the instructions for a brand new cave system. The seed decides what the cavern will look like, where you'll find mineral deposits, and which fiends await you within. All of this is determined in a fraction of a second, flash generated when you lock in a mission. This new cave is entirely unique. There are many like it, but this one is yours. So that actually kind of tells me something I didn't really realise, which is that a lot of them, the cave, a lot of what you're going to experience in the mission is decided when you choose the mission, not just from loading into it. I assumed that everything was done in the actual loading process and that just selecting a mission had no real bearing on what's going to happen until you've actually got in the drop pod. Um, so it's nice to know that that isn't exactly how it works. Caves, or more specifically, procedurally generated caves, are what define Deep Rock Galactic. They set the stage for the action, giving life and lore to the game. They're what make each dwarf's traversal tool relevant, enabling each class's function identity, and the game owes a great deal of its replayability to the limitless pool of possible caves to explore. So how does it all work? Let's dig into it. Um, cave generation in a nutshell. Your cave seed 
gets generated right when you select a mission, but the actual cave comes together once you hop in the drop pod. I mean, that's so that makes that does align with what I was sort of thinking as well. As you hurtle towards Hoxies, the cave generator really gets to work. Cave systems come together like pearls in a string, one room at a time, connected by narrow, winding tunnels. While the overall cave system is a unique result of random generation, the individual cave rooms are handcrafted. If you imagine the cave generator as an automated chef, we still want real people to make sure it's cooking with high quality ingredients. There are over a hundred cave room templates to pick from, but many of these templates also contain multiple internal randomizer variants, so spawning the same template 20 different times would still produce 20 unique rooms. Depending on the mission type, length and difficulty, these room templates could get warped, mirrored or overlapped as the cave generator strings them together. On-site refinery missions, for example, mash multiple rooms uh, into one massive cavern. This is why you're likely to see huge herds of loot bugs during these missions, because the entire cave's population all get spawned at the same point. But to understand how this cave generation really works, we need to take a closer look at one of these cave room templates. Uh, Right here, look at this fellow, isn't he beautiful? Um, a cave room template, a Windows 98 screensaver, there's no way to be sure. In focus, how a cave room template works. Every cave room template is composed of intersecting spheres, half spheres, and flat planes. This cluster of shapes tells the cave generation engine what sort of volume to carve out of the solid rock, creating the rooms where each mission takes place. The image above is the template for a cave room. It's the instruction it's the instructions that the procedural generator uses to create a unique cavern. Here's what you're looking at. Green and yellow lines. These lines determine the general shape of the room. The yellow lines act as the outer boundary, the base layer upon which the cave generator applies noise, like textured surfaces and bind specific rock patterns. The green lines are the inner boundary, limiting how far this noise is allowed to fluctuate and push into the space itself. Um, so the, the sort of the major yellow and green lines on the outer edges of the caves that have been talked about there. Small orange orbs. Now, the small orange orbs is something I tried to. I think it's these ones, I believe, at the edges. Obviously, there's a quite. You can see some orange rings within. I don't think it's what it's talking about. Um, it might be actually be these ones here. I'm not sure, but let's read. Um, small orange orbs. You can see these clustered in the center. Yep, there. So those ones. Um, here. Um, surrounded by an outer yellow wireframe, they act as randomized elements. They mark space that might be either hollowed out to create extra volume or filled in with a random protruding rock formation. When this cave is created, each of these has a random chance to be activated or not. This way, each individual cave room can have an even greater degree of unique and unpredictable variety. We also have medium orange half spheres, which are half domes seen around the perimeter of the cave room. Oh, actually, I think that's what those are. It's, it's not... I don't find it all particularly clear, which isn't that unreasonable. I'm not a programmer. I'm not deep in the weeds of um, Deep Rock Galactic cave design. Um, these half domes seen around the perimeter of the cave room mark potential exit paths for the room. In game, these are the areas filled with compacted dirt. The cave generator engine uses these as nodes to link this room to the rest of the cave system via tunnels. Orange wireframe globe. Uh, so the orange wireframe globe, I think it's actually referring to these ones, I believe. The orange sphere in the background limits the size of the cavern. Oh, that's just the big guy, the, the, the big one uh, surrounding it all. Um, it's the background. The orange sphere in the background limits the size of the cavern. In the game, various cavern templates are sorted by different sizes. If the template in question pushes beyond this orange globe, we've got to either recategorize its size or cut it down to fit within the globe. For comparison, directly below is the same cavern template once it's been fed through the procedural generator and rendered in the game. This one template has dozens of major possible iterations and would never look quite the same if we loaded it again. So apparently that is that. Is that what, I think that's what it's saying. Um, a single cavern viewed from the outside using the power of developer magic. Oh. I don't know why that's actually put there. There's no real context for that. But this is an early version of cavern tunnel generation. Simplified wireframe structure elements are clearly visible. Yes, they are. So this is very, I think this is very early as well. Um, what makes a cave fun? While a computer brain is great at randomly stitching a cave system together, it's not so good at deciding what sort of cave is actually fun to play. That's why we have human brains in charge of that part. Anders Heindorf Fredriksen, our boy, Anders, um, what's up? Senior game designer at Ghost Ship Games has been the human brain and complete human person designing the cave room since season 3. In his words, he makes the building blocks that feed into the cave generator. He's the one putting together the cave wireframes like we looked at just above. As he sees it, there are a few key considerations in making a good cave. Traversal, natural wayfinding, and dramatic experience. 
A cave would be a quiet place to carve out terrain and use their traversal tools to get around, but it shouldn't feel like a maze. While larger cave systems can get a little labyrinthine, individual rooms should still feel intuitive, with their shapes funneling players through to the next exit point. It's about balance, not so simple that it gets boring, not so complex that it feels punishing. On top of all that, a cave room should just seem cool. That one comes down to gut feeling. However, Anders can't guarantee all of this by hand sculpting it. He's still got to make design decisions that can withstand random variation from the cave generator. Once I make a new room, I'll load in and play it a bunch of times with Scout, then Driller, and so on. Sometimes I play through it and it really sucks, then I've got to figure out what doesn't work and why, he says. It might be that the visibility is bad, or the room is basically unplayable in some classes. I can only set the framework for the space before the generator gives its own spin on it. There's a lot of trial and error. Um, which have early experience with room generation and shaping cave surface textures. Now this I like, concept sketches with different cave rooms and rock formations. Let's take a look at this in a bit more detail. Um, we've got the cathedral. I'm not going to go through the individual notes, by the which one, but just going to look at them. the cathedral, which is a very interesting, um, uh, depending on how your mind works, a very particular shape. Um, although I feel like you definitely see this, and obviously the room would be extrapolated in like the third dimension, going forwards and backwards from the 2D image that we see here. I feel like you see that kind of thing in manga core. The layer cake, which is something that I feel like I've definitely seen. Um, got the runny egg here, which I feel like is a cave sort of um, formation that is yet to be fully realised. I would love to see it. Um, the shale. Which I think I think the shale has actually come to pass in season five specifically. The ulcer looks absurd. Um, let's hope that never happens. Although it would be cool. Um, the sandwich, uh, which we definitely see, you see that in sort of um, both the tight tunnels and sort of the wider, sort of um, the wider, uh, shallow tunnel. Shallow, the right word. I think shallow is the right word. Very low ceiling, but also wide tunnels that you get. We definitely have the sandwich. The crystalline is obviously a bit more biome specific. The slope, definitely seen the slope. The slope comes up pretty often, and it's um, it's an interesting one. It's it's one of the more um, unergonomic as far as the gameplay goes because you kind of the slope itself is kind of just a hazard or sort of just an unworkable um area of the cave. <coughs> the hot house also feels fairly biome specific. Um. Definitely see that in the fungus bogs and the magma core and the abyss, which just kind of just shows up every now and then just to really throw a wrench to the works. Um, the abyss is obviously an annoying one, but I think its existence is necessary. Um, just for dramatic reasons, really. Um, biomes, furnishing the caves. Once we've got a cave all shaped and laid out, it needs noise and debris. Noise is a technical term for shaping the cave's walls, ceilings and floors. Basically, it's about taking the perfect spherical shapes of the cave framework and crumpling those surfaces into something more interesting and rock-like. Debris refers to the process of sprinkling in assets like smaller rock formations, cobwebs, hazards and the flora and fauna unique to the selected biome. Every biome has its own distinct patterns of noise and debris. Robert Fries, studio art director and co-founder of Ghost Ship Games and also the voice of Mission Control, began working on different biomes just a few months into the game's development. As he sees it, Hox uses different biomes are an essential dimension of the game's procedural generation. Firstly, they give a lot of the characters the planet of Hoxies, but it's also a big way for us to boost the game's replayability, he says. The exact same level will look and play differently depending on which biome is added on top. It determines the enemies and interactive hazards you'll meet. Things like fog and lightning can, can be completely different. Oh, lighting, I said lightning. Um, even the shapes of the caves themselves will be different, and it's then up to the player to figure out how to navigate it. Your selected biome tells the procedural generator how to sculpt the cave surfaces, and how to populate it with flora and fauna. Each biome has a distinct texture palette. Magma Core, for example, applies sharp, rigid ceilings and craggy, jagged edges to most surfaces. Sandblasted corridors, by contrast, is appropriately smoothed, eroded and sparse. Nobody at Ghost Ship Games is a professional geologist, so most aesthetic, aesthetic choices here come down to what looks and feels cool, as it should. Hoxies' biomes draw from real-world caves as well as fiction. Areas like salt pits, glacial strata, or even crystalline caverns, see them like your mine, resemble something you might find here on Earth. I actually have a picture of that. Uh, so I think you've probably seen this before, but this is definitely inspired the crystalline caverns and possibly the salt pits as well. Although I will say, um, this is an interesting thing to search up. Okay, it's called Crate. I actually think I knew that. Crate, which is the salt planet from um, The Last Jedi, was according to Mikkel, and I, I, this is citation needed, I'm not saying this is 100% true, but I'm pretty sure this is the case. Um, Mikkel was inspired by um, Crate to create um, the salt pits, basically. Um, so yeah. Um, while a biome like Azil Wield reflects inspiration from the luminous landscapes of Avatar. In essence, you could view biomes as the finishing touches department in cave generation. 
If the wireframe structure decides the shape of the cave, the noise and the debris are, wall are the wallpaper and furnishings. So this kind of displays a bit of the process of generating that noise. Um, so sort of the start, one round of tessellation, um, a general relax is what it says on top of the tessellation to smooth it out, and then the noise on top. So, But this is still from early versions of the game when they had a blockier, more Minecraft-esque terrain system. Um, so yeah. And this is a prototype debris test from early development, experimenting with cave surface meshes. This is very similar actually to what the caves kind of looked like in the very early stages. I don't think I was actually playing at that time, but there was a time when the game was publicly available that the caves kind of looked like this, obviously with colour um, and different shapes, but the actual textures of the walls and floor. New caves, tomorrow and forever. There's some statistic out there about how you can connect six standard Lego bricks in about a billion different ways. Um, citation needed. You might think about Deep Rock Galactic's procedural cave generator as working in a similar way, but instead of six bricks, it's got a pool of 119 handcrafted rooms and 10 biomes to pick from. Well, there we go, we've got the actual number of rooms, 119 different rooms in total. Plus, it can warp and tweak and overlap all these elements before snapping them together. The infinite cage, cave engine runs around the clock, day in and day out, 365 days a year. On an average, Cave Generator produces about 150,000 new cave systems for players on Steam. I think that's per day as well, by the way. Um, since the game launched to early access in 2018, Deep Book Galactic players have generated and explored well over half a billion unique cave systems, so over 500 million, which is a lot. Um, in some way, you could, save this, you could say this cave machine is the game's main character. In any case, it's the playmaker and dungeon master, setting the stage for all the rest. It's the one to thank for the gigantic dramatic caverns that stretch out into the darkness, as well as the idiotically narrow corridors that, co corridors that cost you the mission when you're rushing to extract. It's with you on every mission, whether it's your first or your millionth. I don't think anyone's played their millionth mission yet. I don't know how long that would take. Um, it'll be there as long as Hox uses minerals to mine, knitting new caves out in the endless dark. So there you go. That's all there is to it, really. Uh, what was the biggest? What's the biggest cave you've ever come across in Deep Rock Galactic? Let us know in the comments. Well, I don't know how you'd really um, portray that. I mean, I've seen some pretty big ones in my time. Um, that's what she said. Also, if there's another subject you'd like to learn about in the next below decks, we'd be happy to hear it. Thanks for reading. Um, so yeah, that's cave generation in Deep Rock Galactic. I think that gives a really, uh, pretty genuinely thorough insight into how the cave generation system works and how it's sort of put together. Um, and yeah, I, I think it's really well done, well written. Thank you, Aaron, as usual, great work. Um, in terms of what we want to see next, um, I would, I'm kind of just on the on the side of um, after a DRG one, I would just love to see a row core one, like just any row core below decks would basically be what I want because um, I think that stuff's so cool. Um, and of course, you know, if you know Ghost Ship, you know they they want to talk about row core, they're just not quite ready to, but. I think I say I speak for everyone when we are very excited to see what they have to show us when they can talk about Brucor, and hopefully that's not in the too distant future. But like I said, once again, it's a very very enjoyable and well written article by Aaron. So thank you for that, Aaron. Uh, keep up the great work. Um, and as usual, if you enjoyed this video of mine, um, although it's not really of mine, I would say it's of Aaron's for the most part, um, then please make sure to like and subscribe, and if you want to see more videos like this, and you want to stay on top of everything to do with Deep Rock and Rogue Core, then make sure to hit that bell as well. Okay, so as always, thanks for watching, um, and I will see you tomorrow, or we'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.